Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 428 Field Artillery Brigade Women's History Month observance. Women's History Month began as a local celebration in Santa Rosa, California. The Education Task Force of the Sonoma County, California Commission on the Status of Women planned and executed a Women's History Week celebration in 1978. The organizers selected the week of March 8th to correspond with International Women's Day. The movement spread across the country as other communities initiated their own Women's History Week celebrations the following year. In 1980, a consortium of women's groups and historians led by the National Women's History Project, which is now the National Women's History Alliance, successfully lobbied for national recognition. In February of 1980, President Jimmy Carter issued the first presidential proclamation declaring the week of March 8, 1980 as National Women's History Week. President Jimmy Carter said, from the first settlers who came to our shores, from the first American Indian families who befriended them, men and women have worked together to build this nation. Too often, women were unsung and sometimes their contributions went unnoticed. But the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of the women who built America was as vital as that of the men whose names we know so well. Women throughout history have shown their determination, strength, and leadership. Women like Mary Walker, the only woman to receive the Medal of Honor. Susan B. Anthony, a champion of women's rights and the suffrage movements. Rosa Parks, who refused to give up her seat during the Montgomery bus boycott. Mary Jackson, the human computer and NASA engineer. Katherine Johnson, the NASA mathematician responsible for the trajectory analysis for John Glenn's orbital missions. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the first Jewish woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, LGBT rights activists and veterans of the Stonewall Inn riots. And in more recent history, General Tammy Smith, the first openly gay female promoted to general in 2012. Captain Kristen Greist and Lieutenant Shea Hamer, the first female graduates of Ranger School in 2015. And Representatives Deb Halan and Sharice Davids, the first Native American women to serve in Congress, and Representatives Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, the first Muslim women to serve in Congress, all in 2019. And of course, Vice President Kamala Harris, the first woman, the first black woman, and the first South Asian woman to serve as the Vice President of the United States of America. There continues to be women overcoming adversity to become women firsts, but that is also the problem. It is 2021, and there are still many barriers placed in the way of women's progress. Barriers that will continue to be torn down by the strength and determination of women all over the world. Um, I always knew I wanted to serve. I always, growing up, I knew that this is what I wanted. Uh, originally, my goal was to travel the world, but once I joined and seen the impact that I could make on younger soldiers, um, it, I just wanted to stay in. And now with all the changes happening in the Army, um, I want to be able to be make a change for the future soldiers, especially females. My favorite part of being a soldier is the challenge that I have every day, meeting new people, the relationships that I make with different kinds of people from different parts of the world. Not only the people around America, but around the world. Now having nieces and nephews that look up to me and they always have questions and I guess I'm one of their heroes now. It, yeah, it's a good feeling. We always had male soldiers that helped us, but um, I didn't think it was fair. I didn't. I didn't like when they would come to my office and be like, uh, "Let me, let me help you with that box," or "Let me," you know what I mean? Um, to me, it was more like, uh, like I'm equal. You know, I, I chose to sign up just like you did. I, I know what it is. So, I feel like as a strong female soldier, um, I got to do. I got to make be an example for them, for the younger female soldiers, to, to show them that it's okay, you know what I mean? It's a, um, yeah, 
you know, of course, there's going to be males, and sometimes it's just their values of being that gentleman. But at the same time, uh, we, we chose to do it. You know what I mean? So why not? Why not hold us to the same standards that the, the males? Are? Uh, a lot of females, you know, ranger females now, um, they can do it. So I think that we we all can. I'm hoping that it's that it continues to move in a positive way for us. I hope that uh, that we continue to show them that that you know that we're capable of keeping up. But at the same time, um, I hope that females don't take advantage of it. I hope that they they see that. You know, females before me, females that serve with me, uh, they've gone through a lot. And they've, a lot of them have done a lot for us so that we can be where we are. So I hope that the females that come after me continue to make changes for the next generation. When I joined, I, I was at a, you know, minimal, like, you know, this is what I'm gonna do to to stay, you know, in the back so that, you know, like not get in trouble, but at the same time, but um, why not stand out, uh, hold yourself to a higher standard and be that positive change for the next generation. I joined the Army. Um, it was a big family tradition, so I wanted to continue the tradition and I just had a really big calling to serve. Um, I worked in the civilian world for a few years. I was a nurse and I needed something more. I really enjoy it. Um, I prefer to be in the field. We came from the field this morning. Um, I definitely prefer it to being in the office and I really like working with the soldiers. I think it's like one of my favorite things. Women who've been every, in every generation have made huge changes and paved the way for people like me because otherwise I wouldn't be able to she wasn't able to be here and make what I'm doing. I think that we should open, there are a lot of limitations now and I think that we should continue to open the ranks so to increase the presence of females. I mean at any given time I'm the only one in a room or the only one in an area and I think that we should continue to open and whatever limitations there are they should, there shouldn't be. There shouldn't be any differences between opportunities for males and females. I was scared. Um, I didn't want to leave home. I was scared, but I knew that I needed to do something different. Um, I went to college, completed college, started my master's, and you know I started my MBA, which is everybody was like, "Why are you going in the army?" And I just I needed something different. Um, I went through a divorce, and I was like, "Oh, I need to support myself. What can I do?" And it was a huge thing just to be independent, do my own thing. And the army definitely helped me grow um, and really flourish. I remember after 9-11 driving, you know, past the Pentagon and seeing the American flag draped over where, you know, the building was struck. And that kind of resonated with me. And um, luckily my uh, college had an ROTC program I was able to uh, commission. I had a female first lieutenant be able to coach me and mentor me um, when I was a fire support officer because she um, had the experience as a fire director and we were in the role together. And so it was cool to have, you know, that buddy system. And over time, as females were being integrated, we kind of, you know, formed that network that we were able to communicate with each other and kind of have that support system. Like if it wasn't for the support groups, if it wasn't for the um, inclusion of women in combat arms, um, we wouldn't have, you know, a well-rounded experience um, of what combat arms means today. I am one of three females that have been a gunnery instructor since the start of the field artillery school. A instructor is super important because you are one of the first people that you know can influence the next generation of lieutenants and that is powerful and so being able to have outstanding role models from the beginning that can not only academically but also personally mentor and um, lead and have, you know, 
that connection with them as they go on to their next unit and be that phone call if they have any challenges is amazing. As you look around the room, you also have the commandants, uh, the command sergeant's major, all represented on here. And standing strong in each corner, the first one you have, St. Barbara, who we have a medal after because it's the legend of St. Barbara, a um, very important figure in field artillery. And then the next person that we have is Molly Pitcher. Women have been fighting with us since the Revolutionary War, um, but they haven't been recognized until 1948 when they received benefits from President Harry Truman. Um, Molly Pitcher was, you know, a heroine that, you know, followed the Continental Army for three years, um, and she served on the front lines in terms of um, assisting with field artillery. And if you see around this room, I guarantee you that. All of our leaders on the wall here have the Honorable Order of St. Barbara, or that medal, represented by um, the patron saint. These are the only two women that are represented in this entire room. Hello, it is a great pleasure to be here with you, even virtually, to help celebrate Women's History Month with the Fort Sill community. I am Colonel Stephanie Tutton, and almost 30 years ago, I was commissioned into the field artillery. It was an interesting time to be in the artillery. The MLRS system was not online yet, and the Model A prototype was sitting in the 214th Brigade Motor Pool, waiting for the first rocket to be fired. The TAP batteries had just been decommissioned, and as I thought about my time at Fort Sill, I remember driving past Big Deuce, Short Round, the artillery half section, and of course, Atomic Annie on top of the hill. I do believe it was Big Deuce four or five when I was there, and I think now it's Big Deuce, Sergeant Big Deuce seven. It was not easy to be in the artillery in the early 90s. There was a general reluctance to see a woman field artilleryman at Fort Sill and even to be near the gun line during the basic course. I was eventually assigned to the Field Artillery Training Center as an XO, and then as a first lieutenant, I took command of the 314-man Headquarters and Service Battery of 1st and 78th Field Artillery. As I sat down to think about what to say today, I thought about the over 200,000 women who are serving in our military today across all of the services. And then I tried to list out a few of those famous names from history. Joan of Arc, Cleopatra, women, Susan B. Anthony, when we think of women's suffrage, Rosa Parks or Harriet Tubman, Madame Curie, when we think of science, or Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel. It might be easy to think of the saints or the martyrs or the politicians or those that drove social reform or a writer. But there are also the Jane Goodalls of the world, a, a wildlife researcher in Africa that worked with the chimpanzees and the, Af and the apes, or Sylvia Earle, a marine biologist, explorer, author, lecturer, and the first woman chief scientist of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and a National Geographic explorer. Her experiences rival those of Jacques Cousteau and I, I suspect most of us know Jacques Cousteau's name more than we know Sylvia Earle. She advanced a lot of the scientific techniques uh, for scuba diving. And also today, Miss Earle continues at the age of 86 to testify before Congress about the pollution in the ocean and the seas and, uh, on, and on overfishing. 
We could also talk to Rear Admiral Evelyn Fields, the first woman to lead NOAA. She started on nautical charting of surveys, was the first woman to command a NOAA ship, and in 1999, she took command of NOAA. I also remembered an article that I had once read about the 6888. This was the only battalion of African-American women that were deployed to World War II. They were sent to England to clear the backlog of mail that had stacked up in the warehouses for the over 7 million Americans that were in theater at the time. The generals estimated it would take six or more months to clear this backlog, but these women got right to work and they were able to clear the backlog in half the time. They set up systems to deal with common names such as John Smith, and they were able to recover mail and packages and return them to the families of the fallen soldiers. From England, they moved to France, again to clear the backlog, and again, they did it in half the time. What I found really compelling about the article is that there was a filmmaker who was doing a documentary on the Hello Girls. This, these were the women from a signal unit who were the switchboard operators during World War I. And it was the Hello Girls who asked the filmmaker if he had ever heard of the 6888. And that was how their story came to light. These women returned back to the United States after World War II. There was no parade, there was no fanfare, due to many of the things that were happening in our country at the time. They quietly went back into their lives. However, we see their impact with the U.S. postal system and our telephone network across, across our country today. I am now at the United Nations headquarters in New York City, and I am the chief of policy and doctrine here for the military components. A big part of my job is to integrate gender and women, diversity, uh, and, the, and the female perspective into military tactics, the doctrine that we write, for militaries all across the world that pledge contingents or units to UN peacekeeping. The United States has about 31 military who are part of the UN peacekeeping system. We have UN, US peacekeepers who are in South Sudan, Central African Republic, Mali, uh, Israel, to name a few. I also have a very personal example when I think of women's history, and I think of my mother. She spent several years in Africa, and the lessons that she taught me have helped me to be the person that I am today. She lived in the tri-border region of Liberia, where she worked with the local population on how to grow rice and also how to harvest honey from the honeybee hives. She also taught English or literacy to the women of the community so that they could earn a living. She also lived in Sierra Leone, on both sides of the rebels going in and devastating that country. She lived in Cote d'Ivoire and she lived in Kenya. And all of those experiences helped make me who I am today. I also remember my grandmother who lived to be 104 and she emigrated from Germany when she was 14 after both of her parents died and she was orphaned. I believe we have a lot to be proud of. And I believe the U.S. military can be proud of where we are today. We made some missteps and we still have some things to do. However, I take heart in some of the great stories and accomplishments throughout our military history. I think of the Tuskegee Airmen and the Code Breakers, the Wind Talkers, the integration of women from the Women's Air Corps, the 6888, and of course the Hello Ladies. We have women soldiers, non-commissioned officers, officers, women commanders at all levels. So, so whether we look back at history and think of Mother Teresa or Aretha Franklin, we see that we see the history and we see the lessons that we can learn. But I also believe that we still have history that, that must be written. Whether as a mother or a daughter, a sister, a ranger buddy, a co-pilot, a friend, a mentor, a coach of a youth team, a big brother or a big sister. The history is there. It just needs to be written. And I think we can be a powerful example with the commitment, the strength of character, and with the quiet dignity, dignity and humility to write that history. Thank you very much 
for allowing me to be part of your celebration. Please be safe during this time of COVID and what is happening in your, your community. But I wish the best to the Fort Sill community and to my fellow Red Legs. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colonel Neil Morgan, commander of the 428th Field Artillery Brigade. I'm a proud soldier and teammate of remarkable women across our Army. I want to thank Colonel Stephanie Tutton for her message. One of the Fire's 50 messages here at Fort Seal is leave the jersey in a better place than you found it. As we observe Women's History Month, I'm extremely honored to have served and continue to serve with leaders like Sergeant First Class Manukin, Captain Grizzle, Lieutenant Pitts, Staff Sergeant Gonzalez, and Colonel Tutton for leaving our Army in a much better place. They are the leaders we need who are trained, disciplined, fit, and lead a culture where we make our Army better each day. Like them, I ask you to make a positive impact every day.